I'd like to thank all of the San Fernando Valley Amateur Radio Club uh, members that came. I've heard really good things. Um, uh, a, a lot of you have um, uh, not just a ham radio background, but uh, engineering background and science background, technology in your in your occupation. So that's that's super. And um, it was volunteered. If you want to talk about some science and engineering, well, have at it. Well, that's that's great, you know, because. Um, when I was first talking about this um, uh, particular uh, patent, and there's, I have about 15 of them, all fairly revolutionary on antenna design. This one is distinct. Um, I was speaking at the uh, Dayton Hamvention that we all know, and um, and uh, it was just a, a brief on the uh, new product showcase and. Um, and uh, I said, well, this is definitely something different. So the question was, well, what does it look like? You know, how is it made inside? You know, and I really didn't have have, have a lot of time uh, at that. It was just a, a showcase thing. And uh, so so um, once you do that, well, then people will say, well, well, how does it work? You know, and then, well, how is it? How does it work differently than standard antenna technology? So. So here we go. I put it all together. I'm going to keep it to about 55 minutes, I hope. And then we'll have questions and answers uh, that I, I really invite. And, uh, and, I, and, and, and uh, despite the fact that there's some technology and engineering and physics discussion here, I'll try to make it as enjoyable as, as, as possible for everybody. Um, just before I go to the PowerPoint, um, and uh, I'll, I'll get off of it midway through to do a display, uh, but before I go to there, yes, uh, my history is um, ba basically, in, in a nutshell, a, a very colorful history, but in a nutshell, uh, started off in, in formal education in physics and mathematics, and not just formal. I, 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 I did it myself all the time. I had a passion for it. It was a purpose. And um in life and and then uh, transitioned into medicine I was a family physician um but um unfortunately with all the managed care and the cost of malpractice and whatnot it, it just just wasn't the same as it used to be so so i i, I meditated deeply for a couple of years i knew that if i was going to do anything else that it would have to be something fairly extraordinary um uh, and, uh, and, and then, and then the vision came to me, which they usually do as I'm awakening. Um, uh, and, and all of the ideas came together in, in, in a nanosecond. Now, when that happens, then you, you know, you have to, you, you have to do the physics of it, the, the, the mathematics of it, the engineering of it, the, the build of it, you know, it, it take, takes some years to then take that flash of a, of, of where everything comes together. This is a different way of doing things and, and then, and then work from there. So, um, um, uh, the, the first, the, the, the first thing that, 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 they came to fruition was the multipolarized antenna paradigm shift, getting away from gain. And I'll talk about that a little bit about, uh, the power and the diversity, you know, the polarization and the spatial diversity building antennas three dimensionally, uh, just like at about that time, the circuit engineers, and we have some really good ones here. I've heard, uh, um, we're, we're developing Wi-Fi equipment, also cell phone equipment, but Wi-Fi rather than one long antenna on your Wi-Fi router, multiple small antennas, you know, with, 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 with diversity and, and even, uh, uh, a MIMO multiple in multiple out. Right. So the, that, what I had come up with was, was, was new and it was a single feed way of doing that where essentially you had phase delays built into the antenna so and and now we have this okay and and what is this this is a this is a small antenna uh so just before i jump in is is is, is small good no usually not right when you shrink the size of an antenna all kinds of horrible things happen i mean um you, you know even even back in the day of cb we all know if for those of us started there you know if you have a full size cb antenna you start shrinking it 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 works pretty well at six feet and five feet and four feet and uh, three feet you know now you're getting two feet it's horrible you know so you get decreased performance bandwidth all of these kind of things so the goal here was to develop small but still high performing and you couldn't do it with standard antenna technology. I needed a new revelation here. Small for the vehicle, 
I mean, we've all been there where, you know, we're driving in and out of our own garage or parking garages, hospital, whatever the case may be, uh, through drive throughs you know, and, and, and what do we do? We, we wound up going outside, taking the magnum mount, bringing it inside, using fold-over antennas, you know, quick disconnects. <laughs> we've all been there jumping in and out of the vehicle. And what about HOAs? What about uh, what about the people we live with? You know, that, uh, you know, uh, condos, apartments, you know, how can you get reasonable performance and all that that means in a small antenna, that would be the goal. And that's, 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 that's what this is about. So I'll, I'll go to the PowerPoint now. Compactenda.com is the website. There's a lot of good information on there. I hope I, it's, it's also a fun website to go to. Um, uh, I, I, I hope you agree. Um, small, high-performance antennas. All right. So, uh, compact antennas for what? Well, for, for ham radio, CB, scanner, police scanner, uh, land mobile radio, that's newer, really getting a lot of traction. GMRS, which is actually a, uh, um, um, a property of the LMR1 antenna, and shortwave receive listening. For ham radio, specifically the two meter, 220, 440, and 20 meter band. This is actually a photo of my vehicle <laughs> where I have the uh, one antenna here, uh, the, uh, the two meter, 440 plus. I'll talk about that. That's newer. It's really the premium two meter, 440 uh, antenna. They're all good, but it is the premium. And, and then over on the other side, uh, the, the scan three, because I like to have a dedicated scanner radio in my vehicle. Um, notice they're at the corners. They're right at the corner. That's very important. We're going to talk about that. Why don't I just talk about that right now? And then we can brush over it uh, uh, quickly on the other slides. There's so much different about this, this technology. And one is placement. Uh, typically, uh, you know, what, what, what do most manufacturers say? Get it in the center of the roof of the vehicle. And I've been there myself. And I, I remember the day where it was like, yeah, because of all the ground plane in all directions. And, and but, but, but now we have sun roofs, we have moon roofs, whatever the case may be, or we can't put it there at all with some of the newer, especially electric vehicles. It's, it's, it's just not there. <laughs> So, you know, I, I often then would wind up taking the, and there's only one location in the center of the, the roof on the vehicle. That's the center of the roof. Any other location is not ideal. It's not, it's not optimized for the technology. I, I would often struggle having an antenna at different locations on the vehicle that I would prefer. And it, it, it really didn't match up as well as I wanted. This is the opposite. This is the opposite. It's not a hindrance that you need to be on the corner. It's actually a benefit because there are four upper corners of the vehicle. Do other corners work? Sometimes they do. They're not officially recommended because the best is one of the four upper corners. But, you know, people have wound up putting it on trunk lids and even uh, hoods on Jeep vehicles and, 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 and such things and, and, and getting good success with it. Um, but, uh, but, but that's, that's what's recommended. It benefits from the downward counterpoise. You may, and let me get this out of the way, because I know we have a really smart group here. You think, oh, what about the omnidirectional characteristics? Okay. When you put an antenna at the corner and you think of um, getting a non-omnidirectional pattern, you're particularly thinking of HF antennas, whether it's a 10 meter antenna, a 20 meter antenna, a CB antenna, whatever the case may be, because essentially the ground plane in the opposite direction pulls the signal that direction. Well, you know, even by the way, on the HF antenna with the 20 inch, yeah, believe it or not, it's only 20 inches tall, mounted on the corner of the vehicle. The vehicle alone is not used here. Again, this is also very different. Notice this, I'll explain this later. I don't use multiple wires as the radios. I use the planet Earth. I use the groundwater. Uh, I use capacitive coupling, okay? So I use sheeting. They're sheeting inside and they're sheeting outside. It's all very different. The vehicle itself becomes essentially a sheet that has capacitive coupling to ground. So even there, you don't get as directional pattern as you would think. But in the VHF, UHF, it's, it's, it's essentially 
omnidirectional period. There is very little clover leaf pattern at all. And why is that? Because now you're dealing with dimensions of the vehicle that are far beyond a quarter wavelength, full wavelength and multiple full wavelengths. Okay, so we got that out of the way. Um, uh, the SWR you'll see is particularly better at the VHF frequencies at the corner. What is this? Well, you know, this was getting so much popularity that people were thinking, you know, this would be great as a base station antenna. So there are various base station adapter kits out there, radial kits and whatnot. They're not optimized. I'll explain that later. So I developed the Compact Counterpoise. It's an absolute optimized ground plane adapter kit made in the USA, very sturdy as well. Everything's optimized. I'll explain that a little bit later. Plug and play. That's what we want this to be. Oh, sometimes you'll play around with getting a little bit more towards the corner, you know. You may not use a five-inch magnum mount, but a three-inch magnum mount to do it because of other structures of the contour of the roof. But once you basically get it near the corner, it's plug and play. And this is a very plug and play a system, which has obstruction penetrating capabilities. People have taken it into attics or, you know, whatnot. And, and because of the obstructions and the environment, you know, the single polarized antenna didn't do the job. This is elliptical polarization. So this is the HF. It's a 20 inch only antenna. You'll see on my website, there are videos. People get very excited about it. They're, they're, they're talking all around the country on a 20 inch antenna. And we're, of course, still uh, climbing on the cycle, uh, the 11 year cycle. We're, we're still near the bottom. It's pretty fun. It's pretty fun. What are the conveniences of, of this compact antenna? Well, first of all, no tuning of the antenna structure, okay? There are small antennas out there like magnetic loops, for example, but you're tuning every time you're changing frequency. Um, and actually it should be turned if it's in its normal configuration as well. So it, it, it's, don't get me wrong, I, I've developed magnetic loop antennas working for um, other companies. There's nothing wrong with them. I did some um, creative uh, modifications. Um, uh, put, put some novelty into them, but there's nothing wrong with that. But but in this case, it's convenient. So we have vehicle and home, and what else? Very really gaining traction is 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 Poda uh, uh, parks uh, on the air, uh, campgrounds, uh, field emergency deployments. But of course, the vehicle, you know, getting in the parking garages, drive-throughs, overhangs, branches. The original goal was to develop a very short antenna to allow you to be able to do that where you, do, you don't have to take it off and get, you know, at least reasonable performance. But it's really surprising, actually. You can look at the testimonials. It's, it's, it's very surprising what it does. And I'll explain why. The home, we discussed that. Uh, examples, well, we talked about that in health, uh, yeah, backyard, mass yeah. pole, okay, all of these things. Yeah, the, the seven and a half inch and nine inch VHF, UHF, they, they essentially look like a, um, a vent pipe. <laughs> so very inconspicuous, whether on a chimney mount or in the backyard on a master pole, you know, you can, th there's not a lot you can get away with in HOAs, but, but this one uh, allows you opportunities. The HF models in the backyard, Look, it's so short and the ground plane counterpoise is so small, really, neighbors won't even see it. They won't even know it's there. And of course, it's small enough to also go into the house in a closet or the attic or whatnot. So this, this presentation is really uh, twofold. We've already done some of it. Um, it's twofold. It's science and technology, and then it's, it's models. Okay. So with the science and technology, well, you can see it here. They're, they're essentially um, four things, really. The first is, is how to get it small and be a high-performing one. Now, now, I've had to coin some new terms because they're not in the literature. So I, I know it sounds like the uh, retro encabulator kind of thing, or, or the flux capacitor. It's the magnetic field resonator. You'll understand once you see it. It's essentially an extended, flat monofiller Tesla-like coil. And you'll see exactly what that means when we get to the slide. What's important here, there's several things important when you're going to shrink an antenna and make it perform well. 
one of them is bandwidth. The bandwidth goes way down. So, so what can you do? You, you can make the you can make the element of a of a larger diameter, right? Or or you can make it a sheet. Yeah. Well, this this involves sheeting. All right. So that helps the, the bandwidth. Now you may uh, have seen or see on IEEE there was an article that was written uh, that I saw after the the the, the, the patent was 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 issued um, that um, somebody took the sheeting of a quarter wave antenna um, and made it various uh, you know shapes which, which all of us antenna design engineers do in, in for various reasons or another and and then they even rolled it. You know, I said, wow, look at this. Um, this create, still maintains some of the wideband characteristics, et cetera. Yeah, that's not this. This is one quarter of one quarter of a wavelength, plus or minus, in height. It's very, very short, okay? So it's an entirely different design in terms of the physics of it. Next important, all right, so we, we, we worked on the bandwidth. Next important is the matching system. Matching systems, the RLC circuits can be so lossy, all right? We need to reduce that loss. We need to take the matching system and build it into the geometric construct of the antenna itself. This reduces loss in a way that it's done. And then it also becomes, an well, the way it's designed, becomes an active component of the electromagnetic field generation. Not only are you decreasing loss from it, now you're making it an active contributor of the electromagnetic field. Pretty cool. A broadband multiband I just talked about. Well, multiband, yet another magnetic field resonator. All right, tuned to whatever. Flutter reduction, that's the next step. All right, now how do you do that? Well, I already talked about different ways in the, in the, to mitigate weak signals in the obstructed world, the multipath environment. You get polarization flip-flops, you get nulls and, and, and hotspots, all right? In, in, in any particular multipath environment, let's talk VHF, UHF, you know, you may have five pathways and some of them are additive, some of them are subtractive. We, we've all gone up to the, the stoplight and, and the signal was lost. So we creep forward a couple of feet and there it is back again. Well, polarization shifts also occur. So circularly polarized, elliptically polarized, they mitigate these drops in the signal that are very substantial. And you'll see a diagram of that later. If you can mitigate that, you actually increase your reliable range. Uh, not if you're going mountaintop to mountaintop, then for the most part, most, most, not completely, most part gain is everything. But once you get off that hilltop, once you get off that mountaintop, then you need something different. Noise uh, reduction, really that too. Well, um, when you have an antenna, we all know about magnetic field antennas where, where in the near field, they're almost entirely magnetic field. So they decrease noise. How do you decrease noise reduction? We get so much noise these days. We get noise from all the man-made structures, the electrical noise, you know, um, even in our own house, you know, switching power supplies, et cetera. Um, that noise, number one, is a primarily vertically polarized and number two, primarily electric field. So if you have a magnetic loop uh, antenna, a small loop antenna that is almost entirely magnetic in the near field, and let's say it's HF, for example, and, and, and you're going upwards of a, uh, a half a wavelength and say you're at 20 meters and, 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 and half of that is 10 meters, 30 feet. You know, if you're in that ballpark, you're going to decrease the amount of noise. Now, the, the small loop is a, is a low efficiency antenna. So often people use it for receive only and then they put a preamp on it. You know, smart smart business. <laughs> I don't mean in terms of manufacturing. I mean, smart in terms of the business of your equipment. Well, if you have a new design on an antenna that is strong in the near field in both the magnetic and electric fields, in, 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 with a little predilection for the magnetic, you are going to get some of that kind of noise reduction. Um, and then, of course, if you have polarization diversity, it's not all uh, a vertical. Diverse pattern, what is that all about? Okay, satellite communication. Well, we know that monopoles typically, even with those with a broad elevation coordinate pattern, 
um, which can help like a quarter wave down in the valley, right? You have a high gain collinear antenna. Well, that's great if you're on the mountaintop, but if you're down in the valley, it shoots the signal right into the valley. You're actually better off with a quarter wave. <laughs> Before I developed uh, my technologies, I used to always, well, do I use on, on two meters? Do I use a quarter wave, a collinear? I used to have a seven foot collinear Hustler Neutronics antenna on there with guy wires on the vehicle. You know, uh, no, actually something in between. Well, that only took care of the uh, the uh, the pattern but all of those monopoles they have virtually no signal going up towards um the the, uh, the apex towards the satellites uh, this does this does we'll talk about the models vhf uhf vehicle base station and hf and the compact counterpoise i talked about this slide is going to be quick because i pretty much already discussed it but the logo itself actually incorporates here's your satellite signal coming upwards. Here's your broad elevation pattern here. Here's your electromagnetic field diversity in terms of elliptical polarization. All right, so what, what is it? I talked about this already. Um, one, two, three, that's what it's all about. The, um, um, the, the matching within the construct, the magnetic field resonator producing the effective electromagnetic field component and the diverse electromagnetic fields, essentially elliptical polarization to reduce flutter. All right, so that was quick on that slide. All right. this, this is the most busy of all the slides. All right, so don't 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 panic. <laughs> I'll just I'll just go through it. I certainly can't do a dissertation on you know senior level antenna design engineering or physics or that kind of thing, but but I try to do the best I could here. Listen, antenna performance, SWR is important. Yeah, and gain is important, but there's a whole lot more to it. All right, let's just walk through this. SWR reflected power, we're all about it. I'm not going to explain it. Um, you know, you send power to the antenna, and if some of the power comes back, well, then it's wasted. Absolutely. Next is antenna efficiency. What is that? By definition, it's the ratio of the power radiated by the antenna to the power supplied to the antenna. In other words, you put 50 watts to it, and, uh, um, and or 50 watts gets to the antenna, how much of it gets radiated? How much of it gets out into the, uh, released into the airways, okay? You'd like it to be 100%. Very few antennas are, antennas are actually 100%. A perfect dipole, uh, a dish antenna with a perfect LNA, you know, will approach it. But most really good antennas are actually in the 50 to 60% range. And some, for example, I developed when I worked for Amphenol for the shark fins, for the Tesla, uh, Tesla vehicle, um, uh, General Motors, et cetera. You know, they were less than 5%. Of course they were. AM broadcast, right? A quarter wave is about 250 feet. That's why the towers are the, the antenna because, the, you know, that's, that's the antenna, 250 foot. Um, you make a difference of just a couple of percent uh, improvement and it's like, wow, that's fantastic. <laughs> But um, so so you have with full size antennas, the electromagnetic field generation and release. What's the percentage losses? All right. So say you have a theoretical antenna construct that's small and you have a reasonable efficiency in terms of the elements of the antenna itself. What else comes into play? All kinds of things. Remember, I said it's SWR gain and a whole lot more. Um, the construct of the element, for example, we've talked a little bit about that. Um, some of you may remember the or know the uh, the, 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 the the Larson cool rod antenna, a, a multiple layer alloy in order to decrease even just a little bit the amount of heat that's generated. Everything is important. So the element, the dielectric, what about that? OK, the dielectric, whether it's air dielectric, or it's, it's one material or another of wrapping of helical coils or in this case, a Tesla like coil. What dielectric is used is very important. The substrate is similarly to the uh, dielectric patch antennas, for example, all different kinds of materials uh, underneath that patch, between the patch itself and the, uh, the ground plane make a difference. The radome, a lot of science, uh, more and more going into radomes. You have an antenna, it works, you put a cover on it, you change it. Absolutely. Um, I, I'm 
very involved in all of these things in 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 the compact antenna as, as well as the path. But um, it can change the pattern of the antenna. It can change the impedance. It can absolutely make make, make differences. Some some materials are much better than others for that. But then again, they may not be as durable. So you know, it's 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 all there. The matching circuit. So why you know I mentioned losses. Well, how is that, Dr. Jack? How, how do you get losses with the matching circuit? Okay. Well, you 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 have the element that the matching circuit is is made of, of the wire and whatnot, the dielectric, like I just talked about, field grounding. Yeah, a lot of the matching circuits are right down near the ground, right, or the ground plane or the counterpoise. So so it, it, even if there is some, and there isn't much, <laughs> standard matching circuits, even there is some field generation, it can be grounded right out. And, and then the intended field, if much at all, can wind up being in cancellation with the primary intentional electromagnetic radiation pattern that the antenna is developed around. <laughs> you know, it has to be in phase or, or it, it needs to be out of phase properly to create elliptical polarization. But certainly you don't want to be in, in, in reverse phase. And, and it can be. So... So th there's much more to this than first meets the eye. What about the compact antenna? Matching system intrinsic, active component as we talked about, beneficial rather than detrimental. We'll see more of that. Gain pattern, line of sight versus topography. I talked about that. You know, you can even have a high gain antenna, but overall low efficiency. How's that possible? Well, say for example, you have a, a very long antenna and you have more gain and you say, well, that's kind of neat. I'm in a very flat area or, you know, I just need to go from one mountaintop to another and that kind of thing. Well, that's great. But sometimes when you actually measure the overall radiated versus the power supplied to it, the efficiency can still be down. It's a fine point, but sometimes it's, it's, it's very important to realize when, when doing engineering of antennas. Signal capture and production. What I talked about in terms of multipath is important for analog because it, it can be irritating and even dangerous, you know, with fluctuating voice coming in and out and, and whatnot. But you know, it's even, even more significant in digital communication. I know we have a DMR expert here. Um, with digital communication, what starts happening? Well, you start getting the following or similar of that, um, uh, packet errors. And, and as you continue to increase your, your packet error rate, you, you can increase your frame error rate. And then eventually you can get throughput drops and then you can actually lose the connectivity. So, so uh, this, this, this property that can be very important, is very important in analog and can be even more important in digital. Um, APRS, um, a very valuable component. So with the signal capture, I've really already discussed all of this. Noise uh, reduction, I've discussed that. You know, it used to be in homes, as many of us know here, that when we were looking for noise, we'd look outside, we'd look up at the poles and we'd look at the you know, we look at the power lines and the and and the, and the transformers up there and 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 whatnot. A lot of times now, it's 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 in our own home or it's an electric vehicle with electric components or or uh, electric components of a vehicle. So we'll we'll talk about that. How do you reduce it? Well, already talked about it. Already talked about all of this: the polarization and the electric and magnetic field. Good, I can get past that slide busiest of them all. So how are things done normally? When you, do, when you want to take a monopole and you shorten it, you know, the high voltage point of the tip starts getting closer to the ground plane. What happens? <laughs> it's not rocket science. Your resistance component starts dropping. You know, you're much less at 72 ohms, 50 ohms, you know, 25 ohms, 15 ohms, you know, goes really low. So you need a matching circuit. And there's all kinds of them. This is the shunt inductance kind. This is the shunt capacitance kind. Essentially, you're increasing the uh, the, the virtual impedance you're by the L LCR circuit, and and you you wind up raising that overall impedance back up to match your your feed system. And there are various things that are done, including capacitance hats. Uh, this this basically has everything, including the kitchen sink, uh, built into it. I know I know that was a quick brush over but that, that'll have to do for now. We look at the AWRL antenna book, by the way, and we see that a monopole is much more than we really realize, much more. It's an LC, 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 all the way up. 
oh, where have we seen that before? We've seen that on, on feed systems, on transmission lines. These are the uh, types of uh, circuit uh, equivalents of transmission lines. Well, of course, because at the end of the day, the transmission line gets split. And that's what your antenna is. It's a split transmission line. Well, when you do it this way, you wind up decreasing bandwidth, decreasing gain, matching circuits, inefficiencies, all of those things that I talked about. Some less than others. Oh, some of them do a great job. You know, on reducing that, for example, depending on the dielectric, use a larger diameter coil, use thicker wire, even go with an air dielectric. You know, that definitely helps. But at the end of the day, it's the other way of doing it. It's the standard way. How is compact tenda different? Well, this is what it looks like. This is the flat sheet. Now there are additional geometric components in here, but this is the essence of it. You have a stem and you have a flat sheet that's rolled, right? And it's very short. So look just for a moment here and, and see that, you know, we know we have the high current portion um, near the base, the magnetic field, oops, I'm sorry about that. And we have the high voltage uh, portion near the tip. Uh, the, the, Right. So, so, so the electric field. So, so let's just look at the magnetic field for a moment. Here you have a horizontally polarized magnetic field. And then as soon as you jump over to the coil, well, now you have a variety of, uh, they're really slant polarization, but for sake of illustration, vertically polarized here, various magnetic fields as you go around the antenna. And, and these are substantially out of phase. That creates a diversity of the electromagnetic field, the elliptical polarization. And the similar occurs with the electric field as you work your way around the coil. That's important. What else is important? The matching circuit. How does that magnetic field resonator, how does that do what it does? Here we have a helical coil. It's much more we're, we're, we're learning all the time to, to what really goes on here. But what I want to, what I want to focus on is on a helical coil, you have, you have not just the inductance, of course you do. You know, you have an inductance for a certain amount of wind. You actually have more inductance for the same length when you do it in a, in, in, in a monofiller Tesla-like uh, in a spiral, all right? That, that's important. But really important is this. In a helical coil, you have interwind capacitance. So the circuit equivalent is right here of this, essentially. And you see you have the parallel LC circuit there at the top. In the case of the compact tenna, and it's kind of obvious when you look at it, you're going to get a lot more interwind capacitance going on here than you are here. So you have a greater inductance, you have greater capacitance, it's in parallel, this is, and of course, anytime you have that type of, of a tank circuit, it's resonating. In this case, it's creating both the electric, but very much so the magnetic near field. So it's a resonator. It's a magnetic field resonator. That's why I use that term. All right. Um, any uh, circuit of that, of that kind, LC in parallel, it resonates. But, but when it's actually creating an active field, I call it a magnetic field resonator. So that's essentially it. Second part of the science and technology, and then we'll get to the models. Let's dig a little deeper. Let's go from the circuit properties. Let's go from the RLC circuit, the circuit properties, um, and, and the macro, let's call it electromagnetic field signal level that we just discussed to the quantum level. All right, now, now that, that's a huge subject. <laughs> and there are theoretical physicists that do this all the time and brilliant people. But some of this is, is actually really important to ham radio operators, to people that use antennas. It's very important. And I, I, I really wanted to bring that home um, to show how, uh, at least in this way, this is just part of it, how the quantum level is important. Here, here we have a classic picture of Albert Einstein and Niels Bohr talking about, you know, the whole theories of relativity, uh, Einstein and, and quantum theory, and buried into the equations. And, you know, isn't that interesting for a moment? You know, a, a lot of times when we're trying to understand the makeup of the universe, we build models. What kind of models? Uh, models in our mind? Um, yeah, we, we can build 
physics models, and if they work great, we use them. Do we know it for sure? No, we can't really see it. We, we have indications, we, you know, but we also have models of mathematics. So sometimes we learn about the physics from the mathematics, and sometimes we, we, we learn um, uh, about the physics from the physics and then create the mathematics around that. So it can go both directions, right? It's just great stuff. So, so it, buried into the, um, and particularly uh, Niels Bohr was talking to Einstein about this because Einstein was all about the space time having the speed of light as a velocity factor, everything. And we're going to talk about that with about antennas. And Niels Bohr says buried into these um, uh, formulas is the non local, the entanglement characteristics. Uh, where the true basis of the physics is hidden, right? Now, we know more about that now with all the further development of, of quantum physics and whatnot, but it was found that there was essentially, therefore, interactions that were occurring even at great distances, not just between uh, entangled electrons, but even at great distances, at, at, almost instantaneously, 10, at least 10 times the thousand the speed of light. And, and Einstein said, that's spooky interaction. So how does that apply to antennas? It absolutely does. With the antenna, with the magnetic loop, we talk about the near field. Well, well, what is this all about? We have the near field, we have the far field. Far field is defined by the equation 2d squared over the wavelength. What does that mean? Well, that means, for example, if you have a half wave antenna, a dipole, all right? Well, then the, then the D is one half wavelength. And what's one half wavelength squared is one quarter over the wavelength squared divided by the wavelength. So we have one quarter of the wavelength times two is one half wavelength. So for a dipole, you know, where the near field components then contribute, this is a very important statement, contribute to the far field, that line, and it's not a line, it's blur, <laughs> but that far field occurs, that far field equation occurs at about a half wavelength away. If you have a collinear antenna, for example, multiple stacked collinearly, say vertically, uh, half wave dipoles as an example, well, then the D is much larger, uh, multiple times that. So you, you can be as much as four wavelengths away. So typically when we talk about far field, we talk about anywhere between mm, roughly half wavelength, even upwards of 10 wavelengths away. And again, there's a blur and that's why, okay? But what does it mean? What do we see here? We see near field, we see virtual photon. What in the world is that? We see, we see photon here. Photon is one of the gauge bosons, by the way. But here we have the speed of light. So here's what I want to say. Think, and this is, an, you know, also the development of physics that was, it was amazingly incredibly occurring in the, in the late 1800s, especially in the early to mid uh, 1900s. There was camaraderie and a lot of people talking. But, but basically what I'm saying is Niels Bohr near field, um, speed of light Einstein far field. Right? <laughs> because here we have in the near field, the immediacy of interaction. We don't have the speed of light over here in the far field where you have the photons propagating. The photons are propagating away at roughly the speed of light, you know, depending on the medium. In the near field, you have interaction going on that is almost immediacy of interaction uh, via the virtual a photon. And I talk about the unseen world here. Let's, let's, let's not do that right now, but that's, that's pretty significant. In the half-wave dipole, then, what do we have in the near field? What do we have? What are the near field components? Well, it's a good antenna. We have the electric field between the uh, high voltage electric portions of the antenna, and we have the near field magnetic component. They're both substantial. Can we use that word? Yeah, it's a full size dipole. And together they contribute to the far field, which is electromagnetic wave propagation electromagnetic. What happens when we shorten the monopole? Horrible things happen. The reduced strength is, of course, there of the electric field, as you simply do not have the displacement between the plus, minus, minus, plus, plus, minus, minus, plus, but your magnetic field is even, is even further reduced. So, so now you essentially have an electric field component of reduced strength in the near field. This winds up generating an electromagnetic field in the far field, okay? 
But all you've got contributing is a reduced electric field for the most part. The magnetic loop has almost no electric field component in the near field. It has a predominance of the magnetic field. It's inefficient. It's low. But, but that is what contributes. What's different about the magnetic field resonator or the compact antenna? Certainly, the electric field strength is reduced from a full-size antenna, but it's greater than expected for size. It's certainly there. It's not like the magnetic loop. It's certainly there in the near field. The magnetic field, which it has some propensity for, is high, is a high strength. So here in the near field, this is the point. We still have what you have in the full-size antenna. You have a substantial electric as well as magnetic field component. And these, if I can use the word contribute, use the word summate to the strong electromagnetic far field traveling at roughly the speed of light. Lastly, the elliptical polarization. That's really significant, everybody. And that's where the near field, far field, quantum physics, immediacy of interaction, speed of light comes into play when, it, when you talk about antennas. I'm going to leave it at that. All right. So this is just a summary of it. And with some terminology, the the, the, fr uh, the fr uh, Fresnel zone and that kind of thing, and 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 that's it. That's, that's just a summary slide. This is this is a diagram. I'm going to just brush over this part here. If you have the full size monopole antenna, th that's in the red line, and notice the peaks are higher. This is when you're near line of sight or line of sight. All right, definitely higher than the compact antenna. Not a lot, a couple dB. But look what happens when you get the multipath environment with the polarization or spatial cancellation. You drop down not just a few dB, you drop down 20 to 30 dB. That's what fluttering is all about. That's why when we do propagation analysis programs, sophisticated ones, and we're looking for at least a 15 dB fade margin, that has a lot to do with that. You don't need that much fade margin with, with the, the type of technologies that I've worked on. See, because here what happens is with the electromagnetic field diversity, you're capturing uh, some of those polarization flux signals. Same thing occurs with elliptically polarized or circularly polarized antennas, but, but this is an omnidirectional. And therefore, you're maintaining a more consistent signal overall. Now, listen, if you are so far away and your maximum signals all right, here we have the maximum, are just above that minimum signal-to-noise ratio, well, then the only antenna that's going to work is the full-size antenna. Same thing with HF, okay? With HF, if you're, you know, low sunspots, ionospheric propagation is poor, and the only thing that's going to pick up anything <laughs> is a full-size three-element uh, three Yagi at, at 200, on a 200-foot tower, <laughs> <laughs> to get just above the noise floor, because that's what the peak signals are, the peak signals, well, that's, of course, going to win out, you know. But when you are uh, in, in at least reasonable strength signals, you're either in a multipath in VHF, UHF environment on Earth, or you have ionosphere polarization shifts, like with that tiny 20-inch, are you kidding, 20-inch antenna for 20 meters? Yeah, you know, you're going to see this advantage. That's saying a lot about a very short antenna. Is it snake oil? When it first uh, came out with this technology, of course, it was just after prototype production. And there was just one model. It was the tri-band, 2 meter, 224, 40. There was no marking on the bottom because there was just that model. Now there are markings. I'll show you that in a moment. Um, but also the, the construct was more of a prototype uh, fashion. Now it's, it's much more sophisticated. But um, is it snake oil? Let's take a look at one of these antennas. There we go. Can you can you read that for me? Now with 20% more snake oil. <laughs> there you go. You see that right there? <laughs> oh, wait, that's the wrong antenna. I'm sorry. That's No, 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 that's from somewhere else. Uh, here we go. Here's the compact antenna. All right, no snake oil in this. Um, this happens to be the 2M440+. plus. How do we know that? Because we look at the bottom and we see the plus sign. If it was an LMR antenna, it'd have an L. If it was the dual band, the, the least expensive two meter 440, it'd be a D. If it's the tri band, it's a it's a it's it's a T. Okay, so um, so 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 there it is. Um, th that is, by the way, very shiny. It's um, 
uh, black um, uh, UV stable uh, ABS. All right. And totally sealed. It's a snake oil. What are people saying about it? Well, I, I picked just a few things. Let's look at the VHF UHF. Bob Grove, the preeminent Bob Grove, infamous, and a great guy as well. Um, uh, wrote in, in the Spectrum Monitor a few years ago, the prediction of signal flutter reduction was true as well. When a knowing flutter interrupted reception of weak signals on the whip, reception was much smoother with the compact antenna. That was on VHF UHF. Scott Robert says in eham.net, there are a lot of reviews there of the tri, very popular tri-band antenna, seven and a half inch. The noise, first thing he says, the noise floor was reduced by approximately three dB. Ah, interesting, right? Noise floor was reduced. We talked about noise and why that happens. There's the statement. And signals were more evenly distributed. Signals were close to the noise, that were close to the noise floor, were observed to have increased by three to six dB. That's very significant. And stronger signals, this shows the credibility the integrity, were slightly attenuated. Absolutely, absolutely. But as long as, as you have uh, all the signals within you know, uh, uh, audible um, uh, range, well, well then it's, it's actually better. It doesn't matter that you're losing a dB or two on the strongest signals. Sometimes you don't even lose that, by the way, but we'll talk about that later. The result is there was minimal fading and the capability to hear signals you couldn't with the other manufacturers and Here, you know, in the beginning, you know, it's so funny. 20 years ago, I came up with the multipolarized concept. It was embraced by maybe about a third of the engineers when I talked uh, about it. Uh, others, you know, snake oil, that kind of thing. And then over the years, it was it was not only accepted, it was it, it, it is the way, you know, it is the way. Uh, you know, the power and the diversity, but whether it's circuitry or if it's antennas or it's a synergistic use of the two of them, you would think when I then come up with something uh, again revolutionary that, that it would be just automatically accepted. Well, for the, it is a little bit more, but boy, oh boy. Well, here's a W4PIG that comes and says, I have the tri band. I had it going for three years, excellent antenna. I had my doubts, but boy, was I wrong. Well, that's nice. That, that's very nice. Again, no antenna technology fits all, but, 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 um, but this, th this fits a lot of needs. Here's, here's Danny Harbor, KI5EXY in Texas on, on his Tesla vehicle. Uh, he says, I have been testing various antennas, including long high gain VHF UHF ones. There is a noise problem when driving as well as when parked. In the on mode, yeah, there's a lot of electronics in there. There's a lot of noise. You ever see an AM radio inside a Tesla? No, you never will. Karma decided that the Fisker Karma, that it just really wanted to have it. You can do it with electric vehicles, but but you need really large, um, expensive LC um, you know, filtering. The electric vehicles, Tesla or otherwise, you know, they, they wipe out AM broadcast. <laughs> and and, and they, they do havoc on, on other things as well, as can be seen here. And he says, even when the repeater is only eight miles away from the location, it was essentially unusable. That's not good. The compact antenna does not have that issue. Now, that's really good. You know, more and more of the auto manufacturers, GM, Ford, you know, are coming out with the electric vehicles, Mercedes, et cetera. Um, so for us ham radio operators, as well as others, land mobile radio communication, this can be a significant part of this. On the website near the top, a really nice a group in, in Kentucky, uh, Lake Cumberland Amateur Radio Association, uh, Brian and his brother, Chris, uh, do, do some nice videos. And on one of them, they took the new two meter 440 plus, it's the nine inch version, and uh, had full signal at 25 miles. And, and that was in a line of sight communication where they went to a mountaintop, a typical place that they test antennas. So it actually outdid the larger full size standard antenna technologies, even in the line of sight environment. What are people saying about the HF? I wanna make a quick comment about this over here. You see this 20 inch antenna. It could be the 20 meter, could be the CB, could be the SW, they're marked. You, you, you see it on the vehicle. Yeah, it's officially recommended for vehicles such as in campgrounds, POTA, this kind of thing. 
stationary uh, use. But um, I will say that there are a lot of users that are reporting uh, a lot of fun uh, using this um, with the vehicle in motion, indicating that there are some very strong, uh, sturdy, reliable uh, mounts that are made for vehicles. Uh, when, when, when it comes to ionosphere propagation, really, you, you can't do much better than get a nice report from a surprise group, engineering group at a, a major defense contractor, which prefers to be unnamed in this case. They took a full 17 foot uh, size tall antenna at, at 20 meters and, and they took the compact antenna and called 20 inches and says, you know what? We noticed something really neat. And I was smiling that when the signals were at their peaks, yeah, they were stronger on the full size antenna. 14 dB full size, seven and a half compact antenna, 13 dB, 13, what else? We have, uh, I think it's 24 up there and this is 13. But when the signals drop below the 10 dB, mic dB microvolt uh, area, uh, it, it, they actually, the signals are, are greater with the compact antenna. It smooths out the signal. Isn't that great stuff? 1.5 dB to 3 dB, 8, 10, 9, 9, similar, 7, 8, very similar. Then look at these. Some of these, almost nothing, that's, you're not going to get much use out of that. You'll get some use out of this. You get virtually no use out of that. Same thing here. So the peak signals are lower, but the lowest signal strengths are mitigated. This is just basically talking about the 20 meter antenna, another video on there, talking around the country with the 20 inch, 20 meter antenna. This is somebody that did a review on the DX engineering, said it's not just a gimmick. The CB antenna on the vehicle. Uh, or in the in the attic, it, it done just this way, he describes, and talking with his daughter miles away. Okay, we're to the models, which you already saw a lot of, but let's just uh, review them. Compact antenna models, there's VHF, UHF, there's a base station adapter kit, and, and uh, the 20 inch antennas. Seven and a half inch is the two meter 440 or the tri-band, nine inch is the premium 2M440. The land mobile radio for government commercial scanner radio. HF UHF, the dual band, the tri band that has the 220 uh, component. The two meter 440 plus goes from seven and a half up to nine, has all the high performance of the seven and a half, an additional roughly dB and a half of gain. It's for the one that wants the premium use, both for mobile as well as for the base station. It's a great base station. And what was the scan three on that compact counter, boys? Really good. Land mobile radio, uh, obvious. VHF, UHF, 750 to 960. You know, there's a lot of radios out there by Motorola, L3 Harris, EF Johnson, Radeon Tate, both monoband and uh, multiband radios. And there are only so many antennas out there. Actually, before the LMR1 was released, similar to Scan 3, but not precisely tuned for the um, uh, SWR, for the public service government commercial bands as well. Um, uh, people compared the Scan 3 with, with, with other manufacturer standard antennas, really delighted to see the performance on a nine inch antenna. But those are the frequencies that we're all familiar with in the land mobile radio community. Pretty cool, pretty cool to have that short an antenna and still operate not just the UHF and, 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 and all the way from 750 to 960, but but VHF in, in broadband performance, specific, especially in the 150 to 162, which is very critical. As a base station um, antenna, it's great, particularly not for the installations that are on 400 foot towers. We have 8 dB I gain antennas, 10 dB gain uh, antennas, you know, that are, you know, 15 foot, 20 foot long. No, uh, but when you're below 100 to 150 feet uh, above average height, above average terrain or above the ground, you know, um, uh, local stations, whatnot, they need a repeater. Great antenna for that as well. Scan 3, basically um, 100 to 1500 megahertz with a predilection for the government and commercial uh, bands. So, so what antenna is right for you? There's just so much. You can't be an expert at anything. So, so you know, some people like to operate multiple frequencies, multiple bands, multiple modes. Some like to take a couple of bands and, and modes and really, you know, optimize it as best they can. So, if, if, if for the cost conscious ham radio operator, 
the, you know, the two M440, it's $89. And the price has not gone up, unlike everything else. The tri-band adds the 220. It's kind of self-explanatory. The 2M440 Plus Ultimate. I love that one. Also higher power handling capability. The two meter, it's seven and a half inches, 85 watts VHF, 50 watts UHF, um, 50% duty cycle, one minute key on, one minute off. Um, it's all in the specs. This is 100 watts uh, and 75 watts on 440. Also here, 100 watts. These are conservative rating. Uh, there's a lot of similarity between the build of the LMR1 and the 2M440 Plus in terms of construct. How do you mount these? Thermal style mounts on the VHF UHF, okay? Um, the corner I talked about. Uh, so what do you use? Magnum mounts. If you use a magnum mount, flat style magnum mounts work the best. That's great. Keep the height down. <laughs> Think of this, it more mimics the through hole mount. By the way, with, with any mounts where you're going to be drilling, including even nice little inexpensive bracket mounts for the corner, say you have a Ford F-150 with an aluminum roof, you can't use a magnet mount, it's a very inexpensive way to go. They even make, there's all kinds of mounts now made available. You adjustable universal mounts for all the hatchbacks, I've used this one. Um, it's great, you know, gives you good clearance and all of that. Before you drill the holes, it's always good to have a magnet mount. And, you know, test the SWR in that area and know you, that you at least get a, a rough idea you're doing well before you drill the hole. As far as magnet mounts, a lot of people wonder, oh, they're really not good. You know, the capacitor's cuffling and all of that. If you want to know the formulas, I decided to put it all together. It's on my website on the installs page. You can go through it. The bottom line is three inch mag mount is great for VHF, UHF. You're, you're even good on HF as low as seven megahertz, 40 meters with a five inch magma, I wouldn't recommend it, but you know, well stationary, <laughs> but uh, it, you know, the formulas are there if you want to see it. The compact counterpoise, I'm going to summarize this by saying this, listen, there are base station radial kits out there. They stick straight out. Okay. There are two components of the base station adapter kit, a radial kit, a counterpoise that are important, SWR and pattern performance. And they vary back and forth at VHF, UHF, and the in-between 220 as you change the lengths and you change the angle of these elements. I thought, why not? I mean, this isn't brilliant, but it, it, it's clever. You know, why not develop a plug and play? Every, I try to make things as plug and play as possible. Make a plug and play base station adapter kit that works for everything. What do I mean? Well, all of the compact tenant models. Other models? Yeah, a lot of them too. So that, you know, you're getting the optimum performance, you know, on VHF and UHF, both in terms of SWR and, and pattern and performance and make it nice and rugged at the same time. Um, so so it's, 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 it's a nice little, it's a nice little piece. I use it myself. It just as one clue, if, if, if you start improving the, the impedance by bringing the radials down, for example, on VHF, right? But when you do that, you, you actually on UHF, you, you, you make it a little worse and, and you distinctly disturb the elevation coordinate pattern. A lot of people don't know. Straight out, you have advantages in other ways, but not all of the advantages that this does. Last slide on VHF, UHF, the micro beam. It, it, it's a cool, very small part. So small that, 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 that entirely built, you can get it up into an attic and fit it into many attics. You can put it on a, on a chimney mount or in a pole mount in the back and hardly be seen. It looks like vent pipe. How did I make it so small? Well, first you have this as small. And you know, and of course the, the, the radial kit. And and then and then by taking advantage of the, the near field, this spacing is, is smaller than you would usually see on a directive antenna, a beam antenna. And and then reducing the vertical size on the reflector by using a full loop but then benefiting from the horizontal spatial characteristics and the gain component that you get by using the loop. The bottom line is you get a much more powerful antenna than you would think for uh, a very small. And Bandit certainly thinks so on, on YouTube. He recently did a YouTube on his and um, well, he, he, he just loves it. it. It's linked on my website. Hey, Jeff, uh, we're coming to the final here. Thank you for your patience. Uh, I, I described the technology a little bit more, the science a little bit more, because I was uh, encouraged that the audience is very um, engineering prolific. So thank you. Um, it, it already discussed this. There are three models, 20 meters CB and shortwave. Um, 
this is this is this is explained well with the spec sheet that comes with it as well as the website this is a, a sheet of a galvanized sheet you know roofing sheet from the the home improvement store you can use two smaller sheets if you'd like and overlap them this is standard aluminum foil comes out the other end eight long the intent at the corner it matches up really really well and 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 that works both on the ground you could even put mulch over this i mean talk about a hidden antenna what good is a small antenna if you need, you know, <laughs> 36 or more wire radials that are the 30 to 40 feet in all directions? This is, again, different. It's using capacitive coupling to the water table. This is the same thing in the attic, my attic, <laughs> and uh, here in a vehicle that I talked about. And that is the last slide. The vision, the very small quantum gives great appreciation of a glimpse of comprehension of the very large, the universe, all things. I'll turn it back to you for questions.